So uh, uh, our, our next uh, session, you'll notice that we've put a couple new uh, forms on the table, some big A3 uh, uh, size pieces of paper. We're going to be using those, and over the next about 90 minutes or so, uh, we're going we're to have a series of breakout sessions that are going to be focused on the topic of moving from testing to implementation. So once you've got a, a process, a system that can assemble Mr. P in 6.4 seconds, how do you make that permanent? How do you make it so that you always uh, get that result and that you, it doesn't matter if we replace one of the team members, uh, that we'll still get that result and so forth. So how do we, how do we get to a place of permanence or uh, a, you know, the development of a new status quo consistent with the outcome that we're interested in? Well, that's really the balance of what we want to talk about over the next uh, uh, little while. And so the way that we're going to do that is first we've got to decide if we're ready for a new status quo, if we're ready for a permanent change. And so we're going to talk about that. We have a little breakout session around that associated with your projects. Then we've got to uh, think about uh, uh, what are all the different things that, that, that are associated with uh, permanent change. And, and we don't often consider that when we're focused at the front line just on uh, clinical care, for example. And so we're going we're to consider those things. And then we're going to get together and then uh, uh, think about uh, what are the things that we need to change within each project. Okay? So just as you recall, uh, you, you, we started off a little over a year ago now with, uh, <clears throat> with a driver diagram that looked kind of like this. It was a little chaotic, and I think the one that uh, uh, Diana showed this morning is actually much simpler and maybe much nicer. W one of the things that happened since we presented this is that each of you actually developed a driver diagram for your project, and that driver diagram is a representation of your theory of change. And over the balance of the last uh, six to eight months or so, you've been updating that with your learning. You've been going back and saying, well, we, we tried this idea and it worked well, or we tried this idea and it didn't work well, or we, we, conceptually this was a good idea, but it took us 17 tries to get it right, as in the case of the, uh, was it the delirium uh, tool there, which we just heard about, which was just fantastic. Uh, so there's been a lot, of, a lot of trying, there's been a lot of failing, but there's been a lot of learning from that. And then there's also been a fair amount of success consistent with that. And so at this point, we need to start considering where we are with relationship to making a permanent change. And we've been trying under various conditions for some time. Now, if we think that we've got a tool uh, like the Delirium team does that's ready to be rolled out and that needs to be the de facto way of doing things, then we, uh, we need to, to decide how do we make that decision that we know that we're ready. Well, one of the ways that we can do that is using this uh, table. And you'll notice that most of the things here are conceptual. That means that in, in some ways they are subjective by their very nature. But they are decisions that we have to make as individual teams. So for example, the Delirium team might look at this table and say, where are we with regards to the assessment tool? Okay? So where are we with regards, first of all, to staff readiness to accept the use of this tool? Right? And so we could have staff who are resistant to using the tool. We could have staff that are indifferent to the use of the tool. Or we could have staff that are ready to embrace it, that they're quite excited about the tool. Now, I would argue that 17 PDSAs ago, the staff were likely resistant to it, uh, indifferent at best. Okay. Now, today, 17 cycles later, having gotten all of their input, having had the trials that we've had, we feel a little bit more confident. We feel uh, like maybe people, at least where the testing occurred, are more ready to embrace this tool. Okay. And so we, we would we would think about that it, when we were trying to decide whether or not we're ready to implement or to make the change permanent. The other thing that we're really, really probably even more interested in is this idea of how confident we are that the, that the change that we were making will result in the improvement that we're interested in seeing. Okay? So we've been, we've been doing a lot of little things and we've been collecting data either at the PDSA level or at the project level about how we're doing. Uh, for example, we saw uh, from the Smooth team, they're collecting data on uh, all of the uh, 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 all of the patients that they're seeing on a weekly basis. Well, now they're starting to get to a place where they could predict the number of patients that they're going to need to see next week or the week after, right? And they're starting to, to get a, some some prediction around that. They're also uh, collecting a lot of information on the errors that they're preventing, right? And so now they've got some ability uh, to predict what types of errors they're likely to see. 
uh, and, and they'll, they'll have some sense of, of what they can expect out of the system. And because of that data that they've collected, their confidence has increased uh, about the uh, utility of the change that they are putting in place permanently. Okay? And so we have to evaluate the changes on our driver diagrams, the changes in our, in our theory, uh, according to how confident we are that they will result in the improvement that we're interested in. And only when we have high confidence, only when people are ready, do we start to consider that we might be, uh, uh, it might be time to make a permanent change. Of course, the last thing here is this little column right here. That is the cost of failure, right? So should we make this change permanent? And should it not work, right? If it doesn't work for everybody, or it doesn't work for 90% of people, it only works 30% of the time, is there, is there a, a negative outcome, right? Is there a negative outcome that could result? And how negative is that outcome? All right, well, in some circumstances, we want to make changes uh, that, are, that are very powerful, but if it were to go wrong, it would result in death. Right? I think I shared with you the last time we were together the, the story of the first human heart transplant. You guys remember that story? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you remember who transplanted the first human heart? Yeah, Christian Barnard. I heard a few people say that. He was a South African doctor and the surgery was carried out in Cape Town. Right? Well, he didn't just go out and, and, and transplant a heart. Right? He, he, why is that? Because the cost of failure was very, very high. Right? If, if it didn't work and a person died on the table or shortly thereafter, it had been a long time before we got transplants of hearts going again. Right? So there's a real high risk there of failure. Well, we might have some real similar circumstances in our projects. Maybe not quite to the area of death, although maybe, maybe that is a, a possibility. For example, if we had a medication that slipped through and it was the wrong dosage or something like that. But we want to consider the failure. And, if the failure is large, we can destroy the political capital for change. We can destroy the will for change. We can destroy uh, uh, the evidence that what we're doing works, right? We can, we can really debilitate ourselves when it comes to transformation. And so we want to consider these three elements, the cost of failure, the confidence that the change will result in improvement, and the psychological piece, which is the readiness of the staff to accept the change or the readiness for the patients to accept the change, or maybe both depending on the circumstance, right? So we heard a, a nice one there from uh, uh, was a, the, the example of, uh, of uh, 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 women who were afraid to leave the hospital after three days, right? Well, that, that's, that's, a, that's along this category here of readiness. Are we, are we ready to do that? And we, we really need to be if we're going to make a change. And so what I want you to do during the first breakout session here for the next 15 minutes or so is I want you to consider uh, the changes that you have been testing, right? So consider your PDSA trees, consider your driver diagrams, consider the work that you've been doing over the last several months, and have a conversation. Pick out uh, uh, the ideas uh, that you've been using and attach them uh, to, to, your, to your piece of paper here. So what we've done is we've provided uh, post-it notes on each of the tables. You'll see little post-it notes. Some are pink and some are green and yellow and so forth. We'd like you to, as a team, brainstorm all the ideas that you've been testing, right? All the things that you think are going to make an impact and make a difference uh, for the patients under your care. And we want you to assign those ideas to one of these boxes, okay? So where are you using the scale of readiness, cost of failure, and confidence of improvement? Where are you? And we, we want to figure out how many of the ideas are ready for permanent change, how many still require more testing? And here's the real critical thing, there's no right answer. There's nothing written in the book of improvement that says that all of you have to be ready to implement every change today. Right? There, there, there is nothing to that. If you do have a change that's ready to implement, then we're going to talk about what it takes to do that. If you have changes that still require more testing, that's fine. Wouldn't it be nice to identify where the weaknesses are? and what we need to test for. Do we need to test for acceptance and readiness? Do we need to test for, for, for greater uh, evidence in terms of uh, our, our confidence and so forth? So have those conversations uh, uh, and, and talk through the criteria, assign them, and then we'll come back and do some feedback there. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to uh, pause your conversations uh, for just a, a few minutes here. And, uh, and then we're going to 
we're going to jump back into the into the table work. But uh, what I wanted to do through this last activity was set the stage uh, for implementation. And I think it's probably important that I define uh, what I mean by implementation, uh, because I think my meaning may in some ways differ from uh, regular usage of the word. Uh, when, when I think about an implementation or when people in uh, the field of quality write about implementation, what they're talking about is uh, when, a, when, when something that you're planning to do differently, when a change of sorts is now applied everywhere all the time. Right? So it's, it's applied to every patient who will come through that pathway every day in perpetuity. So there is an element of permanence to it, right? Well, in a, in a project management type framework, implementation is we come up with a good idea and then we go out and we do that. We make it permanent for everybody. I guess the difference from the quality improvement perspective is before we go out and make it permanent for everybody, we do all of the testing that you've been working on for the last several months. And so as I walked around the room, what I noted was that there's real diversity in uh, where you think you are uh, according to each idea. So for several of the groups, there's one, two, maybe four ideas that they think, yes, these are ready to be utilized by everybody all the time, right? And there are several other ideas that still require more testing, that still require more testing, either because people are not uh, maybe because the staff are not ready to embrace the change, or maybe because the confidence isn't quite there as far as the level of evidence uh, in terms of efficacy, or because the cost of failure maybe is high. And so as I moved around, I've seen examples of all of those in the matrix that people have developed. But what I, what I want to insist upon, though, is when we do get to a, a place for implementation, that we still consider rapid cycle learning. So just because we're ready to make something permanent doesn't mean that we get to give up our rapid cycle learning, our PDSA cycle. Okay? We can use the PDSA cycle now in a different way to learn how to make something permanent. And I think that's really what we want to take away from. So if you recall, the first phase of our work and the, the work that we began with uh, eight, nine months ago was around developing ideas to work towards our aim. And we had all these different primary drivers that we were trying to leverage. And in some cases, we had 30, 40, 50 ideas on our driver diagrams and so forth, right? And we were, we were looking at, at trying to do that. And, and so we, we, we went and, and found those ideas and, and, and tried them out in, in, in a way that was non-threatening. And the reason we did that is because of this, right? right? Whatever can go wrong will go wrong, right? And I think we heard that from several of the teams who spoke this morning, that you know, they were always consistently surprised by the fact that despite their brilliance, when they went out and tested an idea, it didn't always work. So despite all the best knowledge and best learning and so forth, the PDSA cycle really helped to identify where, where more information was needed and helped to close the gaps in understanding about how the system worked. Okay. Well, phase two, uh, for, for most of us, it, it is along the continuum of improvement. It isn't like a distinct phase per se, but it's where we, we had an idea that was really, really shaky at first, and now we were starting to build momentum with it. And we were trying it out in different places, like maybe in a different ward, or maybe uh, not just one day a week, but we were doing it five days a week. So we were starting to increase the number of conditions under which the uh, change could be tested. And we did that, in a, in, w whether consciously or unconsciously, consciously for me, maybe unconsciously for you, because I, I wanted to see if it would fail. I want to see where things are going to break down when it's exposed to a diversity of conditions. right? So for example, I, I was watching television the other day, and the, the newest Land Rover has just been uh, uh, introduced. A very sophisticated machine, right? can go anywhere can drive over almost anything, right? But when, when, uh, uh, when, when Land Rover was developing the, the next generation, they didn't just test it like on the streets of London, right? That, that would have been a terrible idea. Oh, it works perfectly on the streets of London. Let's take it to the Mojave Desert. 
that doesn't seem to work here. It's a little too hot. It's overheating. That would have been terrible. What they do is they test cars, they test products, they test things under multiple conditions looking for failures, looking for opportunities where we can make it better. And that's what you've all been working on. And for some of you in the last 15 to 20 minutes, you have identified that your change ideas need that. They need more testing. They need more testing in order to get to a place where they feel very robust and ready for permanence. Okay? And so you can continue to do that, and there's nothing uh, the campaign team won't do to help support that. They're going to continue to support you in testing under multiple conditions. Okay? And so we talk about uh, developing that evidence, going from uh, sort of the, the subjective, qualitative evidence up to very objective, quantitative evidence. And I think part of your discussions have revolved around that, that uh, 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 point there. Okay? When, when we do get to a place where it's time to make something permanent, we face this challenge. Right? It says this, there's nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer, that's you, the reformer, has enemies in all those who profit by the old order and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new. That was written about 600 years ago right, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Right? He, he knew something real important at that moment that we ought to take a, 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 a heed of today, which is that when we are planning to make a permanent change, we are bumping up against the status quo, and the status quo is very, very powerful. It is the status quo because of a reason, right? Because it is the easy way uh, that things are done. It is the way that we are used to doing things. It's the way that we've been trained to do things and so forth. And so we're, gonna, we're about to bump into that. So any of you who are ready to make a permanent change, get ready for a fight. Improvement doesn't get easier as you get closer to permanent change. It actually gets harder, right? All the fun learning and everything that's been going on has been done on a small scale in a safe way. Right? That's never been very threatening to the status quo. Now you're saying, guess what? Every patient has to have this done every day. Ooh, wait a second. You're at, wait, that's real work now. We've got to do something different. Well, how do, how do we ensure that that happens? Well, we, we've used this to identify changes that are ready for that, and now we go about using the model for improvement once again to initiate that new order of things, to initiate that new order of things. Okay? And so uh, we we're going to jump in here. I wanted to give you a quick case study. I know we're sort of a little short on time, but I wanted to show you just how hard it can be to initiate a new order of things. You know that I come from the United States, and you know that in many ways we are very backwards thinking, right? <laughs> and the case example that I'm going to present to you right now is a, is a very good example of just how backwards thinking we can be, right? Here is the difficulty in making a permanent change and how we measure things in the United States. Okay? In 1790, how long ago was that for my mathematicians? 223 years ago. Okay? Thomas Jefferson, the person who penned our Constitution, right? he, said, he recommends that we ought to have a measurement system based on multiples of 10. Does New Zealand use a measurement system based on multiples of 10? That yeah, makes a lot of sense. Right? I've actually lived in several countries where they use a measurement system based on multiples of 10, and I've lived in the United States. And I would argue that multiples of 10, much easier, right? 1821, 31 years later, Secretary of State recommends the same thing, uh, the metric system, to our Congress, and says to our Congress, our, 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 our ruling legislative body, hey guys, we ought to make this a law. Wouldn't that make sense? All right? Jump ahead another 35 years, okay, and we, we pass an act saying people can use this on a voluntary basis, right? We're not going to make it a law. We're just going to, if you want to, go ahead. It's okay with us, right? We're not against it, right? Several years after that, we actually uh, get in and sign a treaty on this, right? And several years after that, Congress says, well, maybe we ought to have both, right? Now, how well, that's 102 years later. 102 years later, we still haven't got the metric system in place, okay? And we're moving forward here, okay? Jump ahead another 70 years, okay? and now 
we're starting to receive pressure from the rest of the world, right? <laughs> Which is leaving us in the dust, particularly in the sciences, right? And we're saying, hey guys, you really, really need to get on board here. But look where we come, all the way to 1991, right? Almost 200 years to the day after it was first proposed. It says that uh, by executive order, right, it's not even a law passed by our Congress, an executive order from the president that requires the use of the metric system by the federal bureaucracy. And what immediately happens? Congress amends it and says, look, you, you could use both, <laughs> right? 223 years later, if you go to the United States today and you drive down the highway, everything is measured in miles. Okay? If you ask me how tall I am, I will tell you in feet and inches. I don't know how tall I am in centimeters. If you ask me how much I weigh, I will tell you in pounds, because kilograms are weird to me, right? In many ways, making a permanent change, even one as simple and as straightforward as the metric system, right, is very, very difficult. It requires concerted effort. Now, I would venture to say that in the United States, we never pursued a quality improvement approach to the introduction of the metric system. Right? Had we done so, we might have learned through rapid cycle uh, learning how to do it more effectively. Right? And because we haven't, I think we're, we're still struggling with that. And it, now it's really only uh, mathematicians and scientists who are really adept at the use of the metric system in the US. Everybody else is, uh, is without it. Okay? It is very difficult. Okay? There are some things that we can learn to take us forward into a permanent change. Okay? We need to manage implementation as a series of cycles, just as we have managed learning uh, during testing as a series of cycles. And so we ought to shrink the, uh, the creation of permanence into manageable bytes, right? Maybe, maybe we want to do it, uh, we, we, we've been testing in one ward, let's make it permanent on that ward. And then we'll think about how to make it permanent on the next ward and so forth, okay? We need support to do this effectively, right? So we're going to need support in the form of data, right? I think probably one of the single greatest things that people have learned over the balance of the last nine or ten months is that data can be very powerful in helping us to see into our system. Never is that going to be more true than now when you're thinking about making a permanent change, right? People are going to say, we've been doing it this way for years. Why do we have to change now? Data is the answer. Data shows the performance of the outcome that we're getting that we don't want. It may show the performance based on our testing of the outcome that we do want and how the new way is better than the old way. Data is very powerful, okay? It also requires ongoing coaching. We can't just say we're going to make a change here. We actually have to help people into that change. All the people that haven't been sitting around these tables are going to need to be helped into that change. Right? It's like learning to swim. You all have been learning how to swim over the last nine or ten months. There's a lot of people out in our, in our system that haven't learned that yet. And we're going to have to help them along. Okay. And then we got to think about the social aspects. And we're going to talk about that at length uh, uh, in, in a little bit here. Okay. And so that, that psychology of change becomes critical. Sort of three approaches to doing it, sort of three strategies that you might consider for your teams as you, as you think about doing it. Some of you have a change that is a just do it change. Okay. Right. For example, the use of an assessment tool. Right. We have spent a lot of time testing. We have real high confidence that this tool gives us the assessment that we need. Then it's a just do it approach. All we have to do is hand over the form. If you use this form, we're going to get the outcome that we need. Okay? That's real simple. And that's, those, are the, those are the types of changes we love. It doesn't require heavy lifting culturally in order to make a difference. Okay? Another thing that we can do is we can slowly replace the existing system. So we can bring our new way of doing things online in parallel to the old way of doing things. Okay? We can do things in parallel for a while and slowly get rid of the old system. Okay? A good example of that in healthcare, of course, is when we have, let's say, two ways of doing things and on one ward we do the new way and on the other ward we do the old way. And why we do that is because in the first ward, right, we are able to develop the evidence, experience, and know-how to transfer into the next ward. Right? We can do that effectively and in parallel. And of course, there is a sequential approach as well, either sequential with uh, individuals or with teams. Right? And, and so 
we can use a sequential approach to, to, to bring it in change. This is especially helpful if we're working on changing an entire process or pathway that is multiple steps. So we're going to change step one and then we're going to work on step two. And we're going to change step two permanently and then we're going to work on step three and so forth. And that's how we would go about using the sequential approach. Okay. So what will be important and the discussions that are coming up for you as a team and you look at the changes that are ready to be implemented is to decide which one of these is going to be best for us. Okay. Which, which one is going to give us the best opportunity to create sustainability and permanence in our environment. Okay. So do we have a just do it type of change? Or do we need a parallel approach where people need to see it happening in order to be convinced that, uh, that they, they should do it that way as well? Okay. The other really critical thing, of course, is that there are several different processes that you haven't likely considered over the last nine months. As you've worked to figure out a clinical process or a reliability process associated with clinical care, these other things have been playing a role, but in a, in a hidden way. And now they have to play a role in an explicit way. So once we've got the change that we want to make permanent down, we ought to think about how do we standardize it? How do we make it standard for everybody? Okay? And then we have to think about the supporting pathways. First of all, d documentation. Right? Are people's job descriptions going to have to change as a result of what you're doing differently? Okay? Do we have to recruit people differently? Right? Do we have to uh, uh, capture data in a different way? Do we have to report or use data in a different way? Right? That's a supportive process. It may not be the exact clinical process that we're working on improving. Okay? What about training? Right? You're going you're to hire new people next week, next month, early next year, whenever. We have to train them into the new way of doing things, not in the old way. But right now, all of our training protocols look like the old way. So we're going to have to go back and rewrite them, and redevelop them. And for any existing people, we're going to have to retrain them. Right? We're going to have to get them oriented to the new way of doing things. And that, that's, that's work. Right? Now, we can use the PDSA cycles to do that, but uh, we ought to be aware that that has to happen. Measurement, of course, we talked about. The other big one here is, of course, resourcing. Right? So there may be physical resources in, in the form of time or in the form of money that you need to have in order to create sustainability. Right? So, for example, you're using a new tool like, in a, like the assessment form. Or in the, in the collab, uh, collaborative that we had together last week, the whole country has gone to using uh, pre-packed materials for the insertion bundle. Well, that's all fine and good, but somebody has to pay for those forms. Somebody has to photocopy them. Somebody has to buy the pre-packs. Right? Where does that money come from? I don't think most of us in this room work in the finance department. And, uh, and yet, they're probably going to have to get involved if we're going to have some permanence associated with things that cost money. Right? And so we're going to need some cycles of learning to figure out how to work with them to do that. Right? So sometimes we have to involve human resources in the form of training, recruitment. Sometimes we have to involve finance in the, in the form of funding. Sometimes we have to uh, get involved with the IT department if there's uh, any sort of uh, technological change that's uh, important and so forth. We have to start considering all of those different things. So for any change that you've got sitting on your table right now that's in the implement box, you've got to start considering these things. Right? Because that's the next bit of work in order to propel us towards sustainability. Okay? In order to do that, we've got a checklist called an implementation checklist that gives us an opportunity to think that through and have those conversations. And you've all got a copy of that on your table. And so what we want you to do uh, is uh, uh, to break out and talk about that. Oh man, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. Uh, or Yeah, actually we'll just, uh, sorry, sorry to confuse everybody there, confuse myself. I want you to break out and talk about that right now. And, Take one idea, and for the next 10, 15 minutes, one idea that's in the implement box, or close to the implement box, for those who, who don't have any that are right there, and see what are the things that we need to consider, and what, 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 are, what are all the things that we need to consider. So what are the measures, right? What are the uh, uh, processes that will be affected by the change that we're making? Not just the one that we're working on, but any associated uh, processes. What types of changes need to happen to documentation? What impact will this have on how we train people? Right? Uh, is there any measurement that's required? 
There's a lot of blank space on there. If there's a, a budgetary or finance issue, note that as well. And so who do you need to talk to? What questions need to be asked and so forth? So work your way through that and then we'll come back together and, and uh, do a little report out. Brandon, yeah. Just one comment. The key part of all of this, and you see this in IT all the time, is as well as wanting to make a change attractive so that it is adopted and taken on, it's what you do with the old way of doing things. Preferably make it difficult, preferably even unable, that it's the old system is able to be used. Because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you get into that, as you've yep. got an American system, <laughs> with your metrics, you've got both going along side yep. by side, and that really, if the old system is still available for people who want to use it, then it's just going to get in the way. Yeah. Yeah, qu quick example of that, in South Africa, South Africa a number of years ago rolled out a district health information system to the whole country. And it was uh, an electronic system for data capture. It was, it was based upon a paper-based system, so people on the wards and uh, uh, would have uh, paper-based registers that they would fill out, and then at the end of the week or end of the month they would summarize that, and then it would be transferred into an electronic form and, and passed up the line. Well, it turns out that they, they created this electronic database system, and then they created the paper-based system to go with it, you know, that supported that. But what they forgot to do was to take away the old paper-based system. And, and so people, of course, had months and months of extra supply of the old system. And what do people do when you have a system that you're used to using? You just continue right on using it, right? And that was a big problem for several months in South Africa until somebody figured that out and then drove from clinic to clinic collecting the old supply and getting it out of there, right? So that's a real, real excellent point there. All right, so dive into the conversations there. Two things to think about, this, this checklist and the uh, uh, style of implementation that you'd like to pursue, okay? Okay, let's come back together again just for, just for a minute or two, or maybe five, and then we'll let you break out again. So I think uh, you're starting to get a, the sense of, of some of these considerations. And probably the last thing I want to talk about uh, that's real critical for, for permanence, for, 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 for a change that we want to implement, is, uh, is, is around the, the, the culture of change. How do we get people uh, to commit to doing something differently uh, from a psychological perspective, not just from a sort of fiat mandate, uh, this is your job type perspective. And so uh, we talked uh, through this and I think there, there are reactions that people will have to change. Right? And these are natural reactions that people will have. And what we want is for them to be committed. Right? That the best case scenario when we go to make a change permanent and to, to, to make it the status quo is to get to commitment. And that, that we would say is the state of being bound emotionally or intellectually to a course of action. Okay. Well, what do you notice about the other four? Right? First of all, there's more of them than there is commitment. There, there, there are a lot of opportunities for people to not be committed, but to be something else, have a different orientation towards our change. Right? And I would argue that some are maybe more destructive than others. Right? Resistance to change uh, can often be explored. We can find out from people why they're resistant and so forth. And so we, we see that that uh, people are resistant when a new way of doing thing is, feels threatening, right? And so we can think about how to message things and how to introduce things in ways that are non-threatening to reduce resistance. What I worry more about are things like apathy, right? I could just care less. I really just, you know, whatever. New tool, whatever, you know. I feel like I was very apathetic as a teenager, you know, whatever. This is, come on, let's just do this, right? Well, you know, showing little or no interest is, 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 is much more difficult, but it is something that you are likely to encounter, right? You are likely to encounter folks who are apathetic towards change, right? And there could be uh, issues underlying apathy that go well beyond the change you're trying to introduce, that, that go towards a level of satisfaction associated with work, right? And, and that, that could have a lot of other factors that get involved in, uh, with regard to that. Well, sometimes the way that we can overcome apathy is through the use of the model for improvement, right? So not always, but for some people, the simple act of using the model for improvement becomes very empowering, 
right? I think for people, and maybe for many of you, uh, when they're introduced to using PDSA cycles and rapid cycle learning about their system, it takes them from a place where they feel controlled by their system to a place where they feel like they have some control over changing how the system works. And so it can be a way to overcome apathy and give people an empowering tool uh, uh, to do that. Okay. Perhaps even more destructive though is compliance. Sure, I'll do it, but you know, when you're not looking, I'm going to be complaining to my friends about this, and I'm going to be talking to other people about what a bad idea it is, and I'm going to be undermining it culturally at every turn. Well, that's, that's rough. We're going to try to avoid that wherever we can. And uh, uh, conformance is, you know, it's not, not a bad thing, but if somebody's only doing it out of pressure, uh, peer pressure or incentivized pressure or fear of, of a punitive uh, judgment against them or whatever, uh, then we don't really have that commitment and there's a good chance that if that when that pressure abates for example when the campaign ends that people will stop doing uh, the change that we're interested in them carrying on right, so we do want to get to commitment and there's several important thinkers who've thought about this perhaps one that is most influential or very influential is a man named Everett Rogers he wrote a book uh, quite a while ago called Diffusion of Innovation and he looked at what, what does it take uh, to, to get people to uh, intellectually or emotionally commit to something. Uh, and he came up with his curve of adoption, which many of you will be very, very familiar with. And he would say that uh, as individuals, we all fall along this curve in different places according to different things. So, for example, uh, when it comes to something like uh, new mobile technologies, um, I, I really am fascinated. I'm fascinated by new phones and tablet computers and so forth. And I might be, uh, you know, over here in the early adopter stage, right? When it comes to things like music, I'm more like over here in the traditionalist stage, right? I haven't changed my taste in music in 20 years. And I'm unlikely to change as time moves forward. Right, so we're all like that. Uh, we, we, we sometimes find ourselves as innovators and early adopters and sometimes find ourselves as traditionalists. Well, innovators are people who are going out and they are either creating uh, changes or creating new technologies or creating new ways of doing things. And, and uh, I think probably if you thought about the members of your team, you'll know right away who those people are. They're the ones who, uh, when we first got started, they were really excited. Uh, to get going on, on making changes. Early adopters are people who uh, are paying attention to the first things that are going to work. They're going to pay attention to the first things that are going to work. The early majority are people who will respond to, the, to even just a little bit of evidence that something is working better than the status quo. Right? The late majority are people who will only come along because we write a policy or we change the law, right? or we, we, we eliminate the old way of doing things as David said earlier. So they'll come along, but not, not necessarily willingly, right? And then traditionalists are people who are just, they're just, they're not going to come along, right? They're, they're going to actively, you know, work against you, right? They're going to do that because they have a way that they've been doing it, and it could be the way that they learned, or it could be that they've been doing it for 30 years, or whatever the case may be, and they just, they don't want to change the way that they do things, right? Well, we're going to have people as we try to make a change permanent who fall into all these categories. And I think if we go back to that Machiavelli quote, you know, why is it so hard? It's so hard because we're trying to move this entire curve. We're trying to get everybody on board and how do we do that effectively? Well, I think there's several things we can do. One of the things we can do is get some champions involved, get some people who are really excited about it. And more importantly, that get some uh, what Rogers would call thought leaders people who have some influence over the population uh, who can help us to do that. So you know, I think we can uh, see that in the general public. We often follow the fashion trends of famous people and so forth. So those, in some ways, are our thought leaders, right? So a designer comes along, and the greatest hope that a designer can do is put forward a piece of fashion that gets worn by somebody famous, right? Because most designers aren't famous. Most of us can't name lots and lots of designers, right? But we see something and we think, wow, that's great. I want to have that, right? So I know, I know that my, uh, my uh, uh, cousin, she's a jewelry designer. 
And it's her greatest, greatest thing in the world. Every time uh, she finds a famous person wearing a piece of her jewelry, she gets really, really excited. Posts it on Facebook and all the rest, right? Well, we have, we have people like that here. We have thought leaders that exist right here at Middlemore, right? So it would be real easy to find them, too. I bet if we left this room and we walked down to any ward or into the emergency room or any part of this hospital and we walked up to the first nurse or the first therapist or the first physician that we met and we said to them, you know, when you're really struggling during the day and you don't know how to do something, who do you go to? Who do you ask for help? Right? They'd give me a name. And I bet if I repeated that experiment four or five times, there'd be one or maybe two names that would start to surface very quickly. And those aren't necessarily the people who have been placed into positions of authority. They might be. They might be a charge nurse or a senior medical officer or something like that. Or they might be a person who is just on, on the same level as far as the hierarchy is concerned, but they're not on the same level as far as the culture of the organization is concerned. Right? And the discovery of those people can be extraordinarily powerful in terms of driving a new change permanently through a system. If you can discover the people who have heavy influence on the wards or in, in those locations, and you can convince them that your way of doing things, this new tool, this new pathway, this new process, is the way to do things, they will exert an unintentional but very powerful influence over what happens in this hospital. And so it's something to take into consideration when we think about generating change from a psychology of motivation perspective. Okay? There are some things that can get in the way of us making a permanent change. Right? Probably one of the ones that we dislike the most is the fact that we've met our goals. Right? We, oh, we met our goals. We don't have to pay attention to this anymore. So we could just stop working on it. And pretty soon we've just degraded right back down to where we were prior to the improvement project. Okay? Another mistake that we can make is just assuming that improvement will hold. Ah, people have noticed this and so forth. We, gotta, we think it'll just, just go on like that. Okay? Third thing that could happen is our resources could get taken away. So if we haven't done a good job of addressing all of those support processes that we talked about just a moment ago, and suddenly uh, the campaign uh, uh, resources are gone, and we don't have IAs to support us in terms of doing, uh, for example, some data analysis and reporting. We don't have project managers there to facilitate team meetings, and they're not taking on that role. Suddenly those resources are gone, we could lose the gains that we have made. Right? We could lose that level of permanence if we haven't made a plan in advance for what to do when those resources are repurposed towards other things. Okay? Which is inevitable. It's always inevitable that resources will be shifted. Okay. Okay. The other thing here is, does leadership still care? Right? So does, is leadership paying attention to, to the things of interest there? So that can be another thing that can, can cause us to not pay attention ourselves. Okay. Um, and, and infrastructure and so forth. So there are a lot of things there that we can, we can uh, uh, be worried about, of course. But uh, there are a lot of things we can do uh, to, de to deal with it. So how do we create will? Well, there's certain things that we can do here, right? We create dissatisfaction with the current state, right? So if we're going to pursue this as like a psychological warfare on the people who are out there, right, who love to do the work that they do every day in the way that they currently do it, and we want to convince them to do something new, well, then the first, we don't just want to sell them a new product. We want to convince them that the product they're currently using is terrible, right? Have you guys ever seen infomercials late at night or in the middle of the day on television? Right? And they show you the vacuum that just won't pick up anything. And you're like, well, that's my vacuum. What are they doing? They're showing you that the status quo is not good. Right? Or they show a professional chef chopping alongside the person who's just putting things through the machine right? that they want to sell you. Well, look how bad that professional chef is at chopping. Right? They're showing you that the status quo is not good enough. Right? Well, we ought to take advantage of that learning. Right? People in advertising have been doing it for 50 years. There's no reason why we can't do that and help people to see what's wrong with the current state of things. Okay? We also want to relentlessly communicate direction. I have to uh, you know, give a hand to our campaign team who has done that and to the leadership team who has been present for every learning session. Uh, 
even being willing to make fools of themselves in terms of putting Mr. Potato Head together in front of us all, but communicating a direction that we are going as an organization or we are going as a team. So being relentless in that regard is, is, uh, is, is, is important. Right? This idea of expressing faith in, in the change and the power that it has is really important too. Right? People pick up on enthusiasm. People want to be a part of optimism. Right? They don't want to be a part of a change where people say, well, it might work. I don't know. I don't really, well, we tried it once and it kind of worked. No. So e even if we have our personal doubts, if we're trying to uh, get people psychologically to commit, we have to be willing to have a public persona or face that says this is going to work really, really well. Right? Right? Now, of course, we want it to work well. We have to do the hard work of developing the evidence that it will work well. And so a lot of times those, those two things go hand in hand. Okay? And we have to be aware and we have to communicate to people that this will be hard. Right? That the, the creation of change is messy. It involves getting rid of the old way of doing things. It involves bringing in a new way of doing things. And that transition period is hard. And there's work to be done within it. Right? And we can't lie to people about that. We can't be dishonest and say, well, it's going to be easy. You know, tomorrow you're going to come to work and we're going to have a new tool and everything's going to be hunky-dory and it's going to be fantastic. We can't do that. People are smarter than that and they know that's not the case. But if you're honest and you communicate that there is a mess but that we're going to go through it together, right, then we have a real opportunity to generate change. Okay? Okay. The other thing, thing here, and I not, won't go through all of these bullets in detail, but provide information as to why. Right? People have a need to know why. Right? I'm, I'm probably the worst about this. I ask why constantly about the world and everything in it. And I'm constantly trying to learn something new. And I think, you know, small children are like that. They go through the why phase. Why are you doing this? Why this? Why that? And so forth. Well, we're all like that to some degree, and we need to communicate to people why we're doing things. And that's, that's important there. Okay. So. We also, messaging is everything. People need to know what they can expect. So when we do things, this is what you can expect to happen, right? So giving people expectation and then fulfilling that is real helpful towards getting uh, that commitment. Okay? Consensus on resourcing uh, is important there. And uh, as we said before, never stop publicizing the change, right? And do so well in advance, right? So some of you have now started to think through all the things that are needed to make the change permanent in your system. When are you going to do that? Right? Are you going to do, do that tomorrow? You do that on Wednesday? I would recommend don't. I would recommend putting it off for two weeks and telling everybody for the next two weeks, hey guys, on Monday, two weeks from now, we're going to make a permanent change to the system. And here's what you can expect from it. Here's what's going to happen. Here's the data we're going to be collecting. Right? Here's how the change is going to look. Right? So have this and help Build the expectation that that's coming. What you don't want to do is show up tomorrow and say, hey, everybody, we're going to do something permanently and differently from right now. Because what happens immediately is that people react to that. So, whoa, 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 I didn't know about this. And that's a psychological reaction, right? Even if it's a really good idea. Okay. So publicizing is critical. So here's what I want you to do is to think through some of these key issues. And I want you to do it from a positive perspective. So that first question there is really important. What organizational, cultural assets do you have in place that can support the change? Who are those thought leaders? What are the things that work really well about your team? What are the things that work really well about the environment that you're trying to change that you can take advantage of in order to generate the context necessary to create a permanent change? So that's what we're going to do with the last five to ten minutes here. And then uh, we'll, we're going to see a video and then uh, have a tea break. Okay. All right. So. Go for it.